What's up guys, Ebra here with Hardware Kinex, and it feels like a long time since I've done a gaming PC build video on the channel. So what did I do? Well, I built a gaming PC, but this time with a little bit of twist. You see, it's 2018, I get it, people really care about RGB, uh, you know, if they're trying to build a gaming PC, they probably look for a component with RGB lighting, whether that's, uh, you know, a motherboard, RAM, CPU cooler, uh, fans, GPU, case, the list just keeps going on. But I wanted this build to be RGB free. At least I tried to achieve that in the beginning by choosing components that were pretty affordable, uh, that had unique designs in terms of aesthetics. But at the end, I actually had to add a few RGB fans to make the build pop a little bit. And as you can see, uh, it's not overly done. It's pretty subtle, so I kind of like the way how it is. It's not glowing with RGB lighting, so it's pretty low key, but it does showcase the aesthetics and i want to focus this build primarily on aesthetics not lighting but aesthetics so asus decided to team up with a few key players in the gaming industry uh, to expand their tough gaming brand uh, so this includes brands like cooler master corsair team group memory and a few more to promote their tough branding uh, it's actually one of the main reasons why i thought this pc would look amazing without lighting the colors just all go together so well What's really unique about this build is that the theme is sort of consistent across the board, but most importantly, it's got some serious power under the hood and it costs less than $1,500, which is definitely, you know, not super expensive, but relatively along the lines of getting you the best, uh, you know, sort of gaming performance along with uh, aesthetics because a lot of people care about that these days. So we didn't want to cheap out on a lot of components, uh, but we also wanted to sort of create a balance between, again, the performance and uh, physical looks. So without any further ado, let's check this out. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. So you're looking for something with class, good value, comfortably populate an ATX motherboard, are you? It's all about the user experience and great airflow. Who knew your temperatures would drop that low? Route the cables behind the cover, illuminate your hardware with built-in LEDs. The H500i is for you to discover. This one's in real life, not in your dreams. Say hello to the link below. The H500 series from NZXT is a go. All right, so the choice for my CPU was the Ryzen 5 2600X that costs around $230. It features six cores with 12 threads, comes with a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz with a boost up to 4.2. Uh, this should be plenty enough for gaming as well as some light content creation, uh, thanks to the inclusion of 12 threads. Plus with a little bit of overclocking, we might be able to squeeze just again, a little bit of performance out of the CPU. Housing the 2600X is the ASUS Tough X470 Plus gaming motherboard. And to be honest, this component was an inspiration for the whole Tough themed build because the PCB features this cool digital camouflage with the light orange accents, giving it quite the unique look. I especially love how the right side of the board has this angular cutout, uh, and that just adds to the aesthetics of this whole build. Now, being a Tough series board, expect high quality components like ESD guards that prevent electrostatic discharge, tough chokes that delivers steady power to the CPU, tough capacitors and MOSFETs. The IO is fairly limited, but it should be adequate enough to power your peripherals and other accessories. There are two M.2 slots with one of them supporting PCIe NVMe drives and a whole bunch of other features that make this a solid X470 motherboard. Now to cool the 2600X, I could have easily gone with the included rate spire cooler out of the box. But if you recall watching my Ryzen 5 2600X review, I wasn't actually able to overclock the processor with the included um, cooler because it just wasn't able to adequately cool the CPU. So I had to go with an aftermarket solution in order to get some results. So given that this is a tough theme build, I picked this, the Cooler Master Master Air MA620P Tough Gaming Edition. That was a mouthful, but nonetheless, uh, it really complements the tough motherboard because it's got the digital camouflage that perfectly matches the motherboard, plus the included fans feature the light orange accents. And given the dual tower heatsink design, you shouldn't have a problem overclocking the 2600X, plus it should keep the CPU relatively cool. Now the fans do come with RGB lining, but for the sake of simplicity with this build, I'll be disabling that on this cooler. Moving on to memory, and this was a no-brainer. I knew exactly what I needed for this build because this kit caught everyone's attention at Computex. So I had to get my hands on it right away. Meet the Team Group T-Force Vulcan Tough Edition 16 gigabyte DDR4 kit 
clocked at 3000 megahertz. It doesn't have any fancy RGB lighting, but it does feature the tough branding with the camouflage that again looks very unique compared to the competition and given its weighted speeds, it should help a little bit with performance. Okay, so for storage, I chose the Toshiba RC100 240GB NVMe SSD. What's really fascinating about this drive is its form factor and the performance you get for the price. This little guy costs less than $80 and sports read speeds well over 1.6 gigabytes per second and write speeds over a gigabyte per second. Again, for $80. And that's incredible considering that there are SATA-based SSDs in the market for the exact same cost. Toshiba was able to do this by leveraging their expertise in NAND flash to design an entire SSD that fits within a single BGA package featuring their state-of-the-art 3D by CS flash that delivers fast performance in a power efficient manner. And there's also the form factor. It's very tiny and cute, coming in at just 42 millimeters in length, plus installing it on the motherboard should be a breeze. For storing my game library, Western Digital's four terabyte blue caviar hard drive should do the trick. One of the cool features with AMD's X470 platform uh, is the inclusion of AMD's Store MI technology. And this essentially creates an array combining your uh, NVMe SSD or SATA based SSD, whatever that is with the uh, traditional mechanical hard drive. And of course uh, the RAM uh, to sort of create this single operating system drive that it reads as a whole drive. So this actually uh, reduces game load times. It accelerates performance. Uh, so I do plan on investigating Store MI on a later video and of course see how it plays out in terms of real world performance and perhaps compare it to uh, Intel's offering, which is Optane. So definitely stay tuned for that video. But Store MI should translate really well with this build because we've got the RC100, which is a fast NVMe SSD along with a four terabyte gigantic hard drive. So all in all, uh, if we find a way to sort of optimize the system and we, by using that feature, I think we're looking at a pretty awesome system uh, for a really good price. And now onto my GPU of choice. I chose the Strix GTX 1060 6 gigabyte. Uh, in fact, this is a discontinued card as of right now, and it was the only one I had lying around the studio, so I just decided to throw it in. Uh, it's direct CU2 design is pretty awesome with the wing blade fans that stay silent during idle operations. Boost clocks are expected to go well over 1800 megahertz. It doesn't come with any fancy RGB lighting, which is pretty much what we wanted. And while the red accents might be a bit of a mismatch, it won't really show once uh, we've installed the GPU inside the case. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a discontinued card, so I'll leave links to some alternative components down in the description. I think a really cool alternative to the Strix GTX 1060 is the EVGA 1060 Superclocked uh, Edition. It costs less than $300. It's a 6 gb variant. Uh, it's super compact and it should really go well with the build because it, again, doesn't have any RGB lighting and it's also pretty affordable. Now, that being said, I'm actually a little bit disappointed with Asus not being able to launch uh, a GPU with the tough branding because they're the ones who sort of started this whole series. So it doesn't make sense as to why they haven't come out with a graphics card featuring uh, the tough uh, color scheme because it would have looked awesome. I mean, imagine a GPU with a tough, with a shroud uh, and the digital camouflage with the orange accents. Man, that would have definitely suited this build but uh, perhaps we could expect that with the new GPU launches that we're sort of hearing about that in the rumors. So yeah, uh, we'll see. Powering the whole system is the Cooler Master Master Watt 750 Tough Gaming Edition power supply. This is yet another product from the Tough Gaming Alliance, and you can clearly see that with the exterior design. It's a semi-modular PSU with an 80 plus bronze certification, and it should be plenty enough to power the entire system, and it gives you a little bit of room for upgradability down the road, plus it's also super quiet uh, during idle and load operations. The case of choice is the Cooler Master Master Box 500 Tough Gaming Edition ATX enclosure. This wraps up the styling of the entire PC with the camouflage imprints pretty much everywhere. So that includes the front panel, the closed side panel, uh, as well as the main tempered glass panel. It really does look amazing in person and even better with a fully functioning PC inside. And it doesn't really require a ton of RGB line components to highlight the exterior design as you can still achieve that non RGB look uh, and it'll highlight the tough branding really well during the daytime where there's lots of natural light. There's plenty of airflow for both intake and exhaust, no restrictions whatsoever. And for $80, this is certainly a unique chassis in the market. So now that you've taken a look at the parts list for this PC, let's actually put it together. Actually, it's built already, it's sitting right behind me, duh. But I happened to film the B-roll, or I happened to film some B-roll of me putting it together. So let's, uh, let's roll the montage.
And so here is the final system. Boy, does it look very unique in my opinion. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite PCs that I've ever built here in the office. Certainly enjoying the way how it looks. The digital camouflage throughout the build, including the motherboard, the cooler, uh, and the RAM, just really adds to the overall aesthetics of this PC, and it really does look amazing. Uh, there's, again, plenty of room for upgradability down the road. And, of course, the lack of RGB makes it certainly look unique. In good lighting conditions, you can easily spot the orange or light yellow accents from the memory, the cooler, and the motherboard. The GPU, not so much, but it is what it is, and I like that. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I actually decided to add a few RGB fans to the build to add a subtle effect. Not super glowing, but to add some character to the build, and the end result has definitely grown on me. In this case, I replaced the stock fans that came with the chassis with Thermaltake's Ring Plus fans, and what's interesting about this set uh, is its muted glow effect on the frame, rather than the spill effect you get with some other fans through the blades. It looks really stealth, and I like that. The good thing is that it doesn't take away anything in terms of aesthetics, but rather I think it gives an extra 10 to 20 points just for looks. I'm aware that I started this build with the RGB-free theme in mind, but needless to say, I have fallen for RGB in a good way, at least I think. But what do you guys think? RGB on or RGB off? Let me know in the comments down below. And the last thing to discuss here is performance. Uh, I did manage to overclock the Ryzen 5 2600X to 4.15 GHz at 1.425 volts using the AMD's Ryzen Master software. Fairly intuitive process, you just have to open the software, bump up the voltage, and of course uh, the frequency as well. So hit apply and you're set to go. Super simple, love how the way it works. And uh, I did also manage to overclock the memory to 3000 megahertz. I did not experience any BSODs while stress testing, so that's fantastic. It really just proves the fact that uh, memory compatibility with the Ryzen is definitely maturing, so that's good news. Uh, but I also did manage to compare, uh, run some synthetic tests and compare the stock versus overclocked uh, setting to see if we're actually getting some performance. So let's kick things off with Cinebench R15. And as you can see, there is a slight improvement in terms of performance. So you're looking at 1333 at stock settings compared to 1401. Moving on to the Adobe Media Encoder test, I took a 12 minute 4K project with GH5 footage uh, and I exported it to the YouTube 4K preset. And at stock settings, the system took 23 minutes and 50 seconds compared to 22 minutes and 27 seconds uh, with the overclock. Uh, and it's not a significant difference because you're only looking about a little over a minute of a difference, uh, which isn't that significant, but you will certainly notice uh, the rendering uh, decrease if you go with something like the 2700X. And now onto some gaming performance, and I'm gonna give you guys a heads up, don't expect a significant improvement in terms of frame rates when compared to stock and overclock, because as you can see with 3D Mark Fire Strike, there isn't a significant difference with both stock and overclock setting. We have Battlefield 1 at 1080p set to ultra settings, and as you can see, pretty much identical results. Uh, and then moving on to Overwatch at 1080p at Epic, uh, the same story relies that you're only looking at one FPS difference, which is just nothing. And then we have Doom at 1080p set to Ultra uh, using the Vulkan API. At stock settings, we got 128.5 compared to 129.2 with the overclock setting. So again, not a significant difference uh, in that uh, title as well. So it really comes down to GPU restrictions because in this case we are using a 1060. So that's certainly a factor to consider. But most importantly, you know, at stock settings, this, the frequencies are actually uh, over 4 gigahertz because you've got XFR2 running in the background. So you could technically leave uh, your CPU running at stock speeds and uh, that should yield to uh, about the same performance when compared to overclock. So technically, you could have gone with the rate spire cooler, but, um, you know, I just decided to go with something a little bit more tough themed. So that's that. CPU temperatures are respectable, I'd say. So I used hardware monitors to monitor the CPU temps uh, and used IDA64 FPU load test to stress test the CPUs for 15 minutes. And at stock, uh, the CPU was idling around 34C with a load temp of 75C. And it overclocked, obviously that bumped it up because we're running at 1.425 volts. And as you can see, at idle, we're hovering around 46 degrees Celsius and 88 degrees Celsius under load, which is actually not that impressive considering uh, it's an air cooler. So temperatures, are definitely not favoring uh, for this kind of an overclock setting for the 2600X and of course the Cooler Master Air Cooler. So having looked at the gaming performance comparing the stock versus overclock setting, it's clear or it's actually, it makes a lot more sense to leave the CPU at stock settings because you're really not getting that much of a performance and you can certainly expect 
lower temperatures. Now, I also did manage to monitor the GPU core frequencies on the Strix GTX 1060, which is discontinued at the moment. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, it actually, the maximum achievable clock that I got was 1949 megahertz, which is insane considering uh, the form factor and the size. So that's pretty awesome. And that about wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed this one. In fact, I had a lot of fun building this PC uh, because it di I didn't have to worry about a lot of RGB components and playing around with the lighting cables and all that kind of stuff. Super, just it's just a super simple build. In fact, the thermal take fans were actually easier to install because it was just one controller box that plugs into the USB 2.0 header and that was it. I didn't have to worry about plugging in the fan cables to the motherboard because everything's controlled via that controller box easily tuck that away on the back side so it just works right away i'd love to hear your thoughts on this build what are your what's your take on the whole uh, tough gaming alliance and the way how asus is sort of uh, collaborating with uh, the, these key players like cooler master corsair team group memory and a few more love to hear your thoughts on that uh, if i were to change one thing with this build uh, that would be the power supply not specifically the power supply by itself but the cables now it is a semi-modular power supply i really wish if it was fully modular so i could have gone with something like uh, cable mods custom extensions with the uh, orange and black um, sleeves so that would have looked really awesome with this build but um, that's the only thing that i wish i would have changed also let me know what you guys think about the performance of this pc uh, more specifically would you have swapped one component for another and of course if you have any alternatives i'd love to take a look at that uh, in the comments uh, also links to purchase all these components will be in the description down below stay subscribed to our channel of course subscribe to our new boot sequence channel for up-to-date news on latest tech news and all that kind of stuff i'm ebor with hurricane x thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one